good afternoon, everyone. My name is Cindy Myers, Exhibits and Meetings Manager at ESA, and your host for today's webinar. Thank you so much for joining us for the first webinar in the Design Thinking webinar series in conjunction with the Ant Lion Cake Competition. Today's presentation will focus on empathy personas and problem identification stages. The presentation will run 45 minutes with 10 minutes at the end for questions. For those of you who are able to stay on the call, the presenters will be doing some activities afterwards and you are welcome to join. We will also be recording today's webinar so it can be posted as part of the ESA webinar archive. During today's session, we would like to make sure you are getting the most out of participating in this online course. All attendees are muted on the entry of the call. On the right hand side of your screen, you'll notice a dialog box with several options. Today, you will use the questions box, which will allow you to post questions or concerns during the session. We encourage use of this tool during the presentation, and the questions will be filtered to the speakers at the end of the presentation. If during the session you are having any technical problems, please type, in, type a note in the questions box to staff, and we'll, we will be able to assist you. Your presenters today will be Dr. Marianne Aline. Research Scientist and Lecturer, Department of Entomology at the University of Illinois, and Dr. Amy Wissa, Assistant Professor, Department of Mechanical Science and Engineering at the University of Illinois. At this time, I will turn it over to Dr. Green and Dr. Wissa. Hello. Hi, everybody. This is, uh, this is Mariana, or I go by M. Hi. There we go. We should look at the camera. Yeah, okay. And this is uh, Amy. So the one with the straight hair is M. The ones with the curls is Amy. Hi. Um, and uh, but we're not gonna leave this on the whole time. How do we turn it off? The uh, the webcam. <laughs> the webcam. The green. No. Uh, all right. There we go. Um, so um, we're gonna share the screen now and go to slides. So Amy is the PC person. I'm the Mac person and uh, together we can get this done. <laughs> so um, welcome to the first uh, uh, webinar on the design process and uh, it is going to be one of three that will discuss the design process and then uh, in the fall closer to the annual meeting we'll have a fourth webinar about how to pitch your idea for the Ant Lion, uh, Pit, comp uh, Ant -Lion Pit competition. So um, Amy and I are doing this because we have some experience doing this. We teach uh, this, uh, the design process. We actually design, uh, but we make it even more difficult. We uh, uh, teach a course on bio-inspired design. So there's an extra step there that all the design, uh, ha all the designs have to be inspired by nature. Uh, but that is not your uh, responsibility today or for the Ant Lion Pit competition. Um, there it just has to be relevant to entomology or to insects. Um, we also have multiple research projects together where, which are also on bio-inspired design like we study click beetle jumping and uh, Amy studies flight and I study uh, cicada wings and so on. So we, we um, actually go through the design process both in our teaching and um, in our research. So um, let's get started. Um, what is design? And uh, there are many, many different uh, uh, definitions. So one, this one's from an engineering book. Uh, it's a, uh, a design problem is a characterization of a societal need. And it doesn't matter if this, this is a giant need or maybe just a small thing uh, that uh, affects um, just a few or maybe like a tens of people rather than a whole uh, community. Um, but there's many uh, challenges um, that you might come through, go through as you're trying to think of a solution or, or, or um, to um, when you're going through the design process. So there, maybe you have a really ill-defined problem statement. You kind of know what the problem is, but do you really? Uh, maybe you're kind of, it's a kind of overwhelming that the solution space is really large or not even well-defined, unknown. Uh, maybe you have limited resources, so you need to be very focused. And then there's also communication challenges. Um, uh, you are an entomologist, or in this case, an engineer. Uh, we are mothers. We are 
uh, researchers, we are all those things um, actually makes it sometimes hard to relate to each other or make it easier. So there are communication challenges, but also definitely opportunities. Um, so, um, so we are going to suggest that for the for when you create a new product that you go through the design process. It will level the playing field. You're all we're all talking about the same thing. Uh, no parts are overlooked. You're not skimming over anything. Um, and you will, we'll see later why that is important. Um, you know where to go next um, and you know, what are the, the different steps. And you are going to be relying on expertise of others, <clears throat> so which means that the diversity of opinions becomes really important and of input. Um, so uh, again, um, for what is common in any design process, is that uh, there are several possible solutions uh, and you and none of these solutions are inherently right or wrong and which means that you probably have to go through many different uh, iterations we will use for this uh, uh, we, we've been using uh, this uh, design process the, uh, from the Stanford D school on design thinking um, and we've used it before in our classes and it's very uh, easy to use. Um, there's many more resources and tools out there that uh, we encourage you to experience. It's just that in these 45 minutes today, uh, we will barely scratch the surface. And then some of the topics that we will discuss today, which are the empathize and the de definition stages, those first two, uh, may sound a little abstract and maybe a little tedious as we're going through them, uh, but I think they're really important. They're, they're definitely something new I've learned from working with Amy. Uh, they help in the design of a successful product or a process. And um, I think by having this, this data that you will come up with in the end, you will actually uh, be able to support your ant lion pitch competition better. So, um, so this is what we have been using, but lately uh, we also use this one, which is actually um, makes more sense to us. It's basically the same steps, the design thinking 101 circle. circle. Uh, again, it goes through the same steps of uh, empathy, like why, why do the users need this product? It defines exactly the problem. You ideate, so you, you brainstorm solutions, you prototype, like you build it and then you rebuild it and, and because you get feedback and so on, you test it and you implement it. So, to, um, so that's what we've been using in our class now and you can go, you know, you can uh, go back steps or you can go multiple th times through the circle. Uh, so this to us makes more sense than the more linear uh, um, design process in the previous slide. So for today, we're going to go through that, that, that blue part, the understand part, uh, which is the empathize and define uh, steps. And uh, we're going to give you some tools on how to go through these different steps, how to uh, most successfully uh, come up in the end with uh, a definition of your user, of the needs, of the problems that you're trying to solve, and how you're going to um, uh, what are the specifications that you're most interested in. So, um, so first step, empathize with the user. Um, why should we even uh, design for a user? Um, well, you are only one of the potential users and as a, you, as a design you need to understand the context in which uh, your design will be used. So how do real people people with emotions that might kind of be different than yours as an entomologist or as an engineer, how do they actually interact with the design? It's not necessarily important that immediately they understand how the design works, but they might get really frustrated if they need multiple explanations of what you're trying to design, what, what, what this new design is. And we highly recommend this really short uh, YouTube video uh, to give you a better idea what we mean by that about about the the interaction between psychology and design so uh, we suggest and it may sound a little hokey at first it definitely was to me but it, 
it, it really makes a, a big difference, is to create a persona. Uh, it will answer what does the user need. Um, so it is a representation. So you have here a, a persona of Jill Anderson. Uh, she's made up. She's not real. Um, it's a representation of a broader customer group. Um, and it, uh, in, in this persona, there's a lot of data about customers, and it's, uh, it's put into one single document, so you can uh, reference it most easily. So these, this is one of the users that you're thinking to design something for. She's 35, she's married, has a child, she lives in Texas, um, so on and so on. So what are some of the things that go in to uh, personas? Well, first, there's a name. Just make up something. Uh, it can even be Sally the thrift store shopper uh, or something like that. So something uh, realistic. A, a photo is always nice uh, to put a, f a face to a name. Uh, so you, but the idea is to create something new and something original, something that you can relate to. Um, and then just like with the photo, you need to uh, make it um, uh, even more personal by maybe adding, adding a motto, like what is she really uh, interested in, what, what is her main goal in life or something like that. Oh, bio is always nice, a little backstory, so how, uh, what do you think this person, uh, what kind of life is she living, what did she do in the past, uh, what shaped her, what are the influences. Uh, what influences her now, her choices now, or his choices now? Um, very, a bit, again, to make it more relatable, you need some demographics like age and sex and income and location, like we uh, just did for, was it Jill? I'm already, see, I already forgot her name, but I know what she looked like. Looks like. Um, so, and there's personality traits. So, for this user that is imaginary, Think about what are the uh, personality traits. So uh, maybe she is a cautious person who likes to compare to shop. Maybe she's not, uh, um, you know, impulsive uh, in, in just uh, ordering the first thing she sees. And what are her motivations? Uh, is a career her main motivation when it comes to this product that you're trying to design for? Or is it family? Or is it something something else? Um, so motivation is really important. So uh, and then there's goals and frustrations. Um, what uh, where what lifestyle is she leading? Uh, and what what are our general life and career goals, uh, for instance? And then uh, also important is in to put in this persona. Uh, preferred brands and influencers. So uh, is she a Payless shopper or does she go for the Gucci shoes? Is that a, that's a famous brand, right? I'm just, <laughs> <laughs> so uh, uh, things like that. So preferred brands and influencers, like what help, what help describe her? So here's another one for uh, Rebecca. Uh, that that was created that we found online, but there's many, many more. And actually, at the end of this um, of this presentation on this PowerPoint, there's some other uh, personas. So again, it, I, I understand that this sounds a little hokey, and maybe a, a, a lot of time will go into this. But that's kind of the point, also, to really think about who your users are that you are designing for. And maybe these are also these these can also be children. Um, and um, uh, if you're uh, if you're designing something for a child, for instance, so uh, I we highly recommend you uh, going through this. And how you do this is just by uh, collecting data on the target users that you think are the users. So maybe you want to design something for uh, the elderly. Go and try to uh, collect some data on what types of elderly live in uh, nursing homes versus ones that live at home, uh, and so on. So, uh, and then develop a hypothesis from that research. And um, and again, uh, I think it's really important that throughout you are working in a team. So it's not you, just you creating these personas, but as a team that you are that you are. Under, 
that you, you come to see your users uh, in a different way because your team members um, experience the users maybe differently. Uh, and also the stakeholders uh, might, uh, might be helpful. So if you actually, uh, uh, the stakeholder is uh, the nursing home um, uh, administration, uh, then you might also want to talk to them about these personas if they ring true to them. Uh, and it, it is just not one persona. We, you probably want uh, multiple ones, more than one per project. Uh, but it, it might be a good idea to, to focus specifically on, on one, like Jill or Rebecca. Uh, but you've, you've personalized it. You've made her, uh, the user more relatable. Uh, and it should only take one or two pages, uh, have different situations and scenarios. Um, the problems that he or she has to overcome. Um, and, then, and again, like involve, include everyone involved in the project uh, so, so that they're all on board with your persona, that they don't think are like, well, that's, this, is, this is not really how I see our user. And why is it that they don't see our, the user that way? Uh, and then uh, ensure everyone develops scenarios, multiple ones. And, uh, it's okay to revisit the persona. Uh, we see this a lot in class. Uh, students uh, are, know exactly who they're going to uh, who they're going to design for. They write the persona fairly quickly, and then they start doing their research, which we'll talk about in a little bit. And then they 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 realize actually um, their the persona or the or their their the client or the the, uh, the user is actually a lot different from what, how they initially, initially envisioned them. And that is, that is great, actually. So we visit the personas and, and add features or, or, or remove uh, outdated personas. A great way to do this, this is one of the tools you can use, is um, uh, the four quadrants. So the, this is called the empathy map. It's really easy to do, to figure out what a person said and what they did. That's just observation and listening and writing it down. Uh, but it's also important to figure out what were they actually thinking at that time? And so what, what were they feeling uh, at that moment? And you can do that maybe by following up with them or uh, 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 kind of uh, reading their, um, their actions, their behaviors. So, um, uh, so Again, uh, I know it's a little tedious, but that that is um, that's it, it's very very useful to do it this way. So this is this uh, I'm I'm moving and move I, we're gonna move chairs now. So uh, Amy can take over for this the second step, uh, the need finding stage. And uh, I have to apologize. Here, need finding is two words. In the rest of the slides, it may be one word. We still haven't figured out if need finding is one or two words. So uh, um, that we'll figure it out. Hold on. All right. So hi, everyone. Um, so now that you've created the user persona, you know who you, who your user is, right? You know who the who you know who you were designing for. And you created a persona that's representative of this broader uh, class of users. Now you have to figure out what they need. So I want to back up a second and say you have already a problem in mind, right? Like design a museum exhibit uh, for children, right? So you have a problem in mind. The first step you did was you defined the users uh, who are the children and you created a persona like M walked you through this. Now we have to figure out what you know, what does your user really need? And I'm going to talk to you about, uh, you know, uh, how to do observation interviews, but I want to remind you that there's another way to figure out how, um, you know, your user needs, and that's through benchmarking. And benchmarking basically means um, comparing with products that are already out there for this user, so existing muse museum exhibits for this um, um, example. The most the output of this is, and to know that you've done a good job, uh, is to find out expressed needs. So those are needs that the customer or the user directly expressed to you, or latent needs. Latent needs are needs uh, that they did not express, not because they're hiding, but because they actually don't know that it's a need. 
and you're going to discover those. And those are really uh, when great products happen. I'm like, oh, I didn't even know I needed this, and now this product makes my life so much better. All right. So uh, steps for refunding, right? You have a user. The first thing is to form a hypothesis about the activity. So, for example, you say, uh, you know, college undergraduates um, use their cell phone to tell time, therefore they don't wear wristwatches. So if your homework or if your design problem was to uh, design a wristwatch, right, uh, for undergraduates, then you need to keep that in mind and see how you can uh, identify, is this really why they don't use a wristwatch and what do they need in a wristwatch if that's what you were about to design. So form a hypothesis about the activity and then gather data. There is two forms of data gathering. Uh, there's desk, so research, existing, um, um, you know, literature, looking at research on your computer. Also, actually the thing highlighted, trips to physical stores or online, that's actually benchmarking. To go there, see what's exists in the market, what's already on the market, uh, you know, how this product is going, uh, like go online, how are the sales for this physical, you know, realization of, that solves, that supposedly solves the same problem that you're solving, right? And then there's field studies, meaning you go out and you collect data firsthand from the user. And this is where observation interviews, um, you know, take place. And then if you do, given the hypothesis about a given activity, and knowing the hypothesis about the given activity, gathering data in the form of desk studies and field studies, then you can really identify uh, cool product opportunities. So um, the first and the important thing when you're like, you have to put your mind into a need finding, um, you know, framework, meaning um, you're, you don't have an idea already. Sometimes, and we all do this, is we know how we know a problem and then right away we come up with, with a solution. We know exactly how we're going to solve this. And then all your need finding exercises are a waste of time. So what you need to do is you need to go out focusing really on understanding the needs and not trying to jump in conclusion, two conclusions while you're doing that. Just focus on what do they really need. Don't worry about how you're going to solve it yet, okay? And then it's really important to come to this with fresh eyes. So go to their environment. Don't just let them, if you're doing interviews, don't hold the interviews in your office. Go have the interviews uh, where they, you know, where the user, in the usual natural habitat, right, in their environment. Um, go beyond the obvious problem, right? So if you're trying to uh, you know, so like, uh, let's, I don't know, let's think of a problem. If you want to go, go beyond the obvious problem. If your problem, and you'll see this, it's designed, let's say a walker for an elderly person, right? Don't just focus on how the elderly person walk. Look beyond that. Look beyond, like, look at movement as a whole, not just walking, right? How do they get up? How do they sit down? Things like that. Uh, again, collect different types of data. Take pictures when you're there, if you're allowed to. Uh, you know, record what they're writing, you know, things like that. And then iterate, do this over and over again. Now, for when you're observing, right, again, we've, I think you've talked about this, keep, um, it's really important to kind of observe from a distance and from an outside perspective. And I know this is really hard because in the first part, we're telling you empathize. So, uh, but now we're telling you to just kind of take a step back and try to get a fresh look to the problem. So what are some of the observation techniques? Um, is try to spend a lot of time. You're, you know, you're not doing anything. You're just sitting there. You're just sitting there and observing what's going on. Uh, and then maybe uh, if you're designing a walker for them, I'll take their walker and try to walk with it and see how, you, how it makes you feel, right? Um, take pictures. Uh, look at security cameras when they're not paying attention, you know, try, I know it sounds creepy here, but the whole point is to really figure out what they really need. Remember, both the expressed needs that they told you about and uh, the latent needs, the things that they don't, e they don't even know they need. So this is actually, I really like uh, the example. Uh, ask them, can you walk me through how you would do this? So rather than say, what problems do you have during your task? So, for example, can you please, you know, walk for me, if you're designing this walker again, can you please walk for me from point A to point B? Don't tell them, you know, why, do you hate your walker? What do you hate about your walker? Those kind of questions really, like, are very closed, uh, like, you hit a dead end 
the super quick with those. All right, so again, observation tips. I don't know if you've seen that word in the last slide. I didn't mention it, but workarounds. Uh, check out the picture of the walker with the tennis balls. Uh, humans, we are very good at workarounds. If something doesn't work just right, we kind of do a quick, quick and dirty fix, right? And it works, and then we don't even, we forget about the problem after that. But every time there's a workaround, there's an opportunity for design changes or for a different solution. So uh, these are some of the tips, right? Set aside your bias, listen and observe. Um, you know, people sometimes say something and just, for example, they'll tell you, oh, I love uh, the doorknob or I love my door. I love my, my, my office door, for example, right? But then every time they come and reach out to the knob, they're grunting or, uh, you know, it takes them a lot of effort. Then that's, a, you know, um, an opportunity for you. Listen to people's story, look for workaround, distinguish between needs and solution, right? Sometimes they've already solved the problem with a workaround, so it's no longer a need, but it's an opportunity for you because it's a true need that they just kind of had a workaround uh, around, workaround around. <laughs> All right. Um, for interview tips, um, when interviewing, prepare questions out of time, right? So don't just show up and wing it. Uh, make sure that you have an idea of what kind of questions you want to ask them. And uh, the reason why is uh, you kind of maybe have a, you know what you're going to plan ahead, like what, what are some of the things you want to probe, right? Whether it's to fill your persona or to really uh, clarify some of the observation you saw, right? So it's great to just have some time to think about those ahead of time. Uh, and then again, ask user for demonstration rather than asking them to just tell you what the problem is, watch for nonverbal cues. Okay, what, especially when you, like, even when you're, when you're interviewing. So, um, to summarize, for need finding, it's really important to express both latent, is to, it's really important to find or uncover latent and express needs from your user. Now that you know who they are after you've created the personas. Um, you can do that by interviewing them directly. You can do that by observing them. I recommend doing both, because what you get from both of those activities are a little bit different. And it's really important after you do, you do those is not, don't forget about, these are both field studies, don't forget about your desk studies where you actually um, should go out and see what are the current products on the market and how yours, uh, because you've understood their needs a little bit better, how does yours, uh, you know, um, improve on the current uh, products that are on the market. Okay, so I know my user, I know what they really need. Now, uh, how do I start getting organized? Like, I think this is, it can get very overwhelming, right? When you, um, I'm going to go back to the museum exhibit example. Um, you say, I have a, uh, you know, I want to create a museum exhibit for children. And now we spend a lot of time creating this uh, user persona. And then you maybe interview the kids, interview their parents, figure out, Okay, that's what they really need in a museum exhibit. Now, I think it's time, it gets time, which is the most important thing, and I think one of the most critical steps. Otherwise, you really get lost, and you, you start finding things in your design later that has nothing to do with what you originally, you know, set out to do. And that, you do that by defining a problem. And there's a lot of tools to do this. However, the tool that we want to share with you is something called uh, an objective tree. And an objective tree is actually a project planning tool uh, that you know has been used in a lot of contexts in design and in project planning and product development, right? And it's basically a way to organize uh, everything your design has to be. I'm going to keep saying that a lot. Everything your design has to be uh, in one picture that you can always go back to and kind of see why you're doing what you're doing, okay? Um, so what you do is you start with a piece of paper and you say, okay, this is everything the design has to be. So, and you get that from your interviews, from your market analysis, from discussing with your team, from your personas, right? This is everything your design has to be, right? Those are your design objectives. And you write the list and make sure that you don't stop uh, when things got hard. Because I think those are actually the more you keep pushing on that list by writing out, the more you really get to critical uh, objectives um, 
that solves critical needs for your user and then it, it gives your product like a leg up. So uh, fine, so now you have a list with all the objectives or everything that your project has to be and then you can maybe write all of these on the little sticky notes and you start uh, putting them in columns, right? So if something has to be strong and something has to be, uh, let's say, um, uh, safe, okay, if you have something, uh, if you have a, a third thing in your hand that says um, it has to be, um, you know, waterproof, then that doesn't really fit in safe or strong, and so that goes into a different column. But if you come up with something that kind of fits in those categories, then you put them under the same categories. And what you kind of come up with uh, is a table, right, and where you have big objectives and smaller objectives. And I'll show you an example of that in a second. The, you know you did a good job if uh, when you go from one upper level to the other, you're asking the questions how, and if you go the other way around, it says why. And I'll show you that uh, in a sec. So once you have, when you, okay, a couple notes about this. The most, some of the things you will realize is when you get down to lower levels, there'll be the same objective that fits under a lot of them, and that's okay. Actually, if you see, if you see yourself having like a piece of paper in your hand that can go in a bunch of places, that just means that it's a really important objective because it satisfies a lot of the important things that you've defined early on. So uh, this is what I was telling you about. To go from a level I to level I plus one, right? You're asking how to go from I plus one back to I to ask why. So how is it gonna be strong? Uh, let's say uh, use metal. Why are you using metal? Because it needs to be strong. Do you, um, Okay, something that's really important, and uh, after you've done this uh, table format where you have, uh, you know, the big thing you want to, you know, design or the big problem you want to solve, higher level objectives, lower level objectives, you have to make sure that, you know, other stuff didn't just sneak in, and other stuff meaning implementations. Like if I start saying, uh, I'm going to start, um, and actually I gave a really bad example when I said it needs to be strong, use metal. That's actually a really bad example because that's an implementation. I already figured out how to make it. Like I figured out too, in too much detail how I'm going to make it strong. And I'll show you an example of that in the next uh, in the next table. So make sure again that we did not talk at all about solutions yet. All this is just setting up your problem, understanding your user, your user, figuring out their needs, and then setting up your problem. So make sure that solutions don't sneak into your objective tree. It should basically be a table or a chart of everything your design has to be, not how it's going to do it and not uh, any reasons why you can't do it. Like, for example, if you uh, start crossing off objectives because you can't build something, that's not that's not the place to do that yet. All right. So uh, just keep, keep that in mind. So this is actually an objective tree from a, a group, a team of um, students in our class this year who are designing an aircraft uh, an airplane with wings that can fold, and they're doing that because they did a um, market study uh, for airports that told them uh, it's really um, the biggest reason why we can't increase our profit is because the depending on the, we can't increase the number of gates, and the reason why we can't increase the number of gates for airplanes to take off is because we need a certain distance between the aircraft. So if you have an aircraft that can have a smaller wings, at the gate and then as it before it goes on a runway it can open its wings then this would be a great you know this would be a, a really cool uh, option to have to increase profitability so they said okay well what does an aircraft need to be it needs to be safe it needs to be maneuverable it needs to be airborne it needs to fly actually to be an airplane and then it needs to be able to change footprint or you know those are the big things and then I think they did a good job well how is it going to be safe well by being structurally sound by being stable by being controllable this, you see, there's nothing here that says, how are they going to ensure stability? How are they going to ensure controllability? How are they going to ensure structural sound, right? So uh, how is it going to be structurally sound? Well, one way to do that is by looking at material choices. They did not jump, jump the gun like me and say that it should be metal, right? Just you can make something strong by looking at material choices. If I'm doing this with them again, maybe I would add another branch near material choices where I would say geometric configuration, right? Um, so, so, and this is, you know, and I, 
I can look here if you, it was hard for you to see, to see how they built their objective tree. Um, so the, the reason why this objective tree tool, in my, in my opinion, is pretty good is now I can go back here and look. And if there's any feature that's coming in my, if this tree is very, if I spend a lot of time creating this tree so that it's very comprehensive, then I will make sure everything in my design can go and point back to one of those boxes. Otherwise, it's not needed. Okay, or if it contradicts one of those boxes, then this did not come from the user, then this, 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 did not, this did not come from my need or from my market analysis. It just came from, I don't know, from some ad hoc source. All right, so um, I've, I have, I'm, I know my user, I know what they need. I created a picture or a table that tells me this is everything my design has to be. My design has to be. Now, and this is where, I don't know, uh, a, lot of, a lot of us do this, right? When we say the design needs to be comfortable or it needs to be light, uh, to me that's very, it's nice and qualitative and super important at this, you know, and that's what exactly what should be steps one, two, and three. It should be very qualitative things derived from, you know, human experiences. But then once you get to step four, you need to really get down into the quantitative a part of things, right? Meaning you take things that the user uh, or the customer has expressed and make it a requirement and make it a constraint for the design. And um, we do that by using metrics or specifications. And a specification has to have a metric and a value. And what that means is if I say something needs to be light, well, that's a very qualitative, I can't measure light. Right? The question is, a design specification has to be something measurable. I think just remember that and that will help you a lot. Is this measurable? To say, oh, it's light. No, you can't measure lightness, but you can say it has to weigh less than three pounds. And then that's something very measurable, either, either less than three pounds or not. Right? So quantitative, it has to have a metric and a numerical value. And again, why? Well, I think I touched already on this. It takes the customer requirements, which sends me comfortable, light, um, warm, uh, squishy, all these things, right? And create and uh, turn it into something measurable. It also, if you have some, if you have a metric, then something is either that or it's not. So then you can, if you're looking at comparing different designs, and we'll talk about that later, but if you're comparing different in later webinars, if you're comparing different designs, you know which one is better than others. They either met the metric or they did not. Um, and then, um, it, you know, so that guy's selection of design, and I talked about that. And then there is method, and then you can be objective. It's not based on preference. It's based on, you know, all the hard work that you've laid down in steps one through three, right? There, it takes out your your bias and how you feel about a design, you know? So here's an example. The product should be light. Well, the product should weigh less than two pounds. Another example. Uh, the product should be fast to assemble. The product should be assembled in under 15 minutes. Okay, the trick on this is never say, oh, you know, this requirement, I can't turn it into something measurable. There's no such thing. There's no such thing as something, if it's not measurable, then it's really hard to justify that your design accomplishes it. So you have to really think hard about this. It might not be obvious, it might be super hard uh, to come up with something measurable, but, uh, I feel it's really important to do that, to come up with some way, a measurable way to discern whether you've achieved this customer requirement or you haven't. Um, so again, this is a metric and a value. Uh, so the metric would be, you know, weigh and pound, which is the unit, and the value would be two. And uh, when you're looking at this, um, you know, let me back up for a sec. When you're looking at this and you have a, you know, a question to say, okay, so I have, let's say, five boxes in my objective tree. Should I have five metrics? Not necessarily. And I'll give you an example. Uh, I'll skip ahead. Let's say uh, you come up with something that says the, your design must be able to read the amount of water in some reservoir. Sometimes to, to, to add uh, quantitative 
measurable things to something that's very abstract and very emotion based, right? You have to define is it determine the depth? Is it determine the quantity of the water, like the volume? Or is it just is it full or not full? You don't have to pick all of these. You can pick one or two, but you know, realize that for a very small objective tree, you might have a lot of specifications. It depends on what showed up in your objective tree. Um, but again, that that goes back to say that try to be methodological about this, meaning look at one box at a time at your objective tree and see, all right, what is the right metric for this? Now remember, even if you might come up with, let's say you have 10 boxes in your objective tree and you come up with, let's say, I don't know, two or three specifications per box, right? Then you're up to 30 metrics. Um, some of them might, at, based on what you know about the user and based on what you know about the needs, some of them might not be very important. Some of them be much will be much more important, so that's okay. And I and I'll show that you I'll show you that in a second. But anyways, a metric should be complete, dependent, measurable, relevant. What does that mean? Measurable can be measured. Relevant has to do something with the box in your objective tree. Uh, dependent meaning uh, it doesn't depend on you know as much as you can doesn't depend on something else. And complete meaning just that one metric is enough to um to achieve like to uh test that one specification right there's different ways to add values it's not like it needs to be three it could be you know it could be exactly three at most three at least three between three and four or um you know so that's just different ways of doing types of values uh, again, and what I was saying, don't get overwhelmed. Not all your specifications or all your metrics are going to be equally important. So if I go back to my uh, the, the um, objective tree that I showed you with my students with the airplane foldable wings, other things are not going to be as important. Uh, you know, some things are not going to be as important as others. And uh, then you don't have to spend a lot of effort meeting that uh, specification because it's not that important. Um, okay, so you, for example, some are crucial for performance, some are for aesthetics. Um, you, you rank them on the scale of importance, and I'll show you an example of that. And if you do this right, if you do, if you create uh, a table where basically, and I'll show you that, where it has your uh, specifications, the metric, and the value, and the importance, when you're comparing different designs that you come up with, it's going to be really easy to say, this is the design I'm going to go with. And it takes out guessing, and that's the advantage of having a design process. Um, so this is another example from our class uh, where they, the group of students, wanted to um, create multiple robots um, that act in a unit to rescue, that act as a unit to uh, rescue survivors out of a natural disaster. Their objective tree is very small. I could, I could expand a lot more on that objective tree. Um, but for example, they said, well, the units have to physically latch to one another and the, and the robotic units uh, have to move cooperatively, right? You will be, be capable of cooperative mo movement. And from that uh, objective tree, they come up with this specification table. The need, it should carry, everything in the need is very uh, human, it's very qualitative, it's very, it comes, you can picture your user saying that. And then if you look at the metric, it should be weight, force, time, number of connection, cost. Uh, so things that are really, uh, that are key, that can be measurable. And then the metric is uh, just basically what the, how are they gonna measure that? And they then rank the importance. This table does not have the value, but you can imagine adding just another column that says value. Uh, so, I guess this wraps up the define uh, the specification part, step four. So I'll turn it back to M now for her to kind of wrap up this uh, webinar and tell you how we're gonna move forward. All right. So that's a lot of information that we went through uh, and we gave you a couple of uh, tools. So uh, for step one, the empathizing the user, we highly suggest you create personas. Um, for need finding, you're doing observations and interviews. Uh, uh, defining the problem is key, like 
do you really understand what the problem is? So you, the, these objective trees are really, really helpful and help you uh, to check yourself. Uh, and then uh, the defined specifications, there's metrics and values that you can attach to them. And I, I would argue that all, having all of these uh, somehow show up in your end lion pit competition pitch, uh, maybe your final report or when you, uh, when, uh, when you present your idea, uh, this will make your case only stronger for why this is a, uh, an inspired design, uh, why this is important uh, to be supported. Uh, by uh, the judges who will serve as uh, venture, who are hopefully uh, some venture capitalists or uh, can put themselves in that situation. So, um, so hopefully this this made sense to you. Uh, we'll, um, uh, we're, I'm more than happy to uh, answer questions now or through email. Uh, and again, this is a this is a little bit. Um, uh, abstract and a little bit, it seems time consuming, but again, I think it's really, really helpful. We see that in our students, in our class, uh, and in our research team too. So next time, which will be Thursday, May 16th, so that's in two weeks, uh, we're going to have a little bit more of an interactive, hopefully, uh, webinar about the next step in this design thinking uh, cycle, uh, where we uh, will teach you or hope to share with you some of the tools that help you uh, come up with creative ideas with, uh, for how to solve a certain problem. And, um, and then uh, after that, uh, we will also have a webinar on prototyping, which is again a very uh, uh, fun one and it's a, a part of the next step. What we won't be able to do is how the materializing, how you test actually um, uh, your product or implement it. Um, but uh, we'll, maybe we'll add that in the future, but for now we'll, we'll leave that up to you. We, of course, it is important to also test uh, the, your design, to go back to your users to get feedback, for instance. All right, um, I think that's it. Um, that's all I know. So, um, and I, again, I would welcome any questions. I'm not, I'm seeing your chat, but I, maybe we can make it more bigger. Can we stop sharing? Thank you. Or can, if Cindy or Willard can uh, relay any questions? Yeah, we've had a couple of questions that have come up uh, through, the, through the webinar, all of which I think we've been able to answer as they come in. Uh, but certainly welcome anybody to uh, pose any questions they have now through the, either the chat feature or the questions feature, or I noticed uh, a couple of people have raised their hands, so we can also, uh, we can unmute people as, as, uh, as is appropriate there. So the first hand I can raise is from, um, and I apologize for the pronunciation, but Benjamin Kamazi, you come there? Hello? Benjamin, your line's unmuted. Can you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you. Excellent. Okay. Um, yeah, yeah. Sort of general. How do you um, avoid mission creep during the objectives tree? I avoid mission creep to, in, while you're doing the objective. Tree. Yeah, attacking on different objectives that you don't need. Oh, like how how do you add? How do you add? Uh, like how do you not add? You have you have. I think that's what why it's really important to have a user persona. Uh, and to make sure that you're not adding like constraints or implementations. So for example, if you have, a, let's say the objective tree that I showed with the foldable wing stuff, if you start now looking at, um, you know, you have every box you add, you have to ask, is, does, does this help it to be safe, maneuverable, like the highest level, go back, the best check is to go back to the higher levels and say, does it relate to one of those? And if the answer is no, you know, if you can't, if you can't answer the question, why am I adding this box? And if the answer to that why is not one of those top boxes, then you have to make sure um, to, you know, to that would be think, mission creep. Yeah, think, think again. So just ask why going up, ask how going down, and if you see there is no connection, then remove that. Does that help a little bit? Yeah. Thank you. Yep. 
Yes. Great. Okay, great. Thanks. Uh, anybody else? We're going to need your line again. If you have any other questions, you can raise your hand again. But anybody else with any questions, feel free to use the, uh, uh, the hand raising function in the uh, GoToWebinar software or the, uh, the question. So we have a question here from uh, uh, from Virginia Chu. Uh, if our idea is to add something to a, uh, an existing product, is that okay? And I think. Virginia, correct me if I'm wrong, but that's a question uh, more towards the rules of the online pick competition. So I think that uh, if, you're, if your idea is to add something, that is okay. But uh, if you look at the previous question uh, about the rules for the nature of ventures that are eligible, um, you, can, you can visit that site to get more information on, on the rules for the, uh, the competition. Yeah, I don't, yeah, I, I wouldn't say, I, I don't think it's not allowed. Um, but I think you'll have to make a very good case for why why yours is uh, so much better, right? And I'm sure you can. Great. So again, just a, a final call for any any questions, uh, either through the raise hand function or the chat function, the question feature. Um, we still have a couple more minutes, so. Um, Uh, so uh, Benjamin uh, asked a question. This is for, for uh, I guess, for, uh, for Marianne. Uh, so, would you ever recommend using uh, personas in a written voice? Uh, say that last part again. Personas in what? Uh, would you ever consider using per personas inter iteratively? Iteratively. Uh... So, Benjamin, I'm going to you can ask your question. Oh, um, here, hang on a second. <laughs> You're saying have we ever used personas iteratively? Is that the question? Yeah, or would you recommend? Yeah. Why? why? Well, because, for example, uh, let's say, um, so remember, a persona is a representation of not just Jill or Becca, right? It's a representation of all, all their users, all your users that look, act, or feel, or can be identified as Becca or Jill, right? And sometimes um, you will be inclined to maybe have seven or eight personas, right? Because you want to create a product that helps everybody. And you'll realize the more you actually look into them, what really, uh, the, you'll see that you want to actually combine some of those personas as far as your product is involved. Like you can combine those personas because uh, the motivations or the goals or the frustration that would cause that user to get your product is actually common, it's the same. And then, so that's why, that's one level of iteration where you're reducing, or one way of iteration, right? That you're uh, breaking up personas or combining personas. Another way of iteration is, um, remember, so a lot of the, you've created the personas and the answer you're asking in the personas is not what the users need, is who they are. And based on that, you've created hypotheses, right? On who they are in life, what would they do in different situations, you know, things like that. Once you go to the neat finding, you might realize that when you observe them or ask them direct questions, that a lot of those hypotheses are wrong. So you have to change them. Uh, and then if you have your neat finding results and your persona in front of you, then you can create your objective tree. And um, it's important to make sure that after your need find, hopefully after your need find, you've learned a lot to update the persona. So I would actually be surprised if you don't update your persona. Right. So, so yeah, so personas can change during the process. So does that answer your question? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, and by the way, I would love to, uh, uh, if you guys have any questions, um, please email me. Uh, this is M, so email me, uh, and I'll relay to Amy if I can't answer it. Um, and I also would love to hear how it goes. Like, what what are you learning? Um, you know, our we teach our class, and they're mostly engineers, and they do it one way, and they're comfortable. Well, many are comfortable with going through this process because they take multiple classes on design. Um, I would love to hear from you, from especially some of the people who are new to this, 
uh, how it goes and, and what you're learning. And, uh, and, and if I can be of any help, that, that I'm happy, I'm here for that. All right, well, if there's no more questions, we'll go ahead and wrap things up. You have one more question now, sorry, sorry. Uh, so this one comes from uh, Brian Lovett, and he asks, uh, where do you design your objective trees, uh, on what software, and how do you build them collaboratively? I didn't get that. So it's a, a, a Brian, I didn't quite hear your question. Um, can you write software? The question is, where do you design your objective trees? What software? Yeah, and then how do you build them collaboratively? I, uh, I we highly suggest you do it outside of like you do it on paper on paper using uh, uh, post-it notes if you are in the same in the same place I guess uh, your team. Um, you can yeah. even like you can even have like a Google uh, Slides or Google. Um, um, document and just create boxes and try to organize the boxes and columns and mm -hmm. then after that um, uh, connect arrows right and that's how you create the tree so first you start with those boxes it looks like a table and then you can start connect arrows and like as we said that you might find that um, a lot of arrows are going to the same box which is not a bad thing at all but I know students in our class because they were not even though they were physically in the same place they were not <laughs> they were like too busy to sit next to each other, so they were using the computer, and they used Google, uh, you know, PowerPoint, uh, like Google Slides or something like that. I think I agree with them 100%. If you can, just get a bunch of post-it notes and go to a wall somewhere and start working. That would be, I think, the most fun. Yeah. And fast, in fact, like iterative, the fast where you can, you know, change things, put things from one column to the other, you know, do the why check, the how check, that makes sense, Brian. But if you find a piece of software that helps, please share. All right. Okay, great. Well, thank you everyone for joining today. If there's any additional questions, feel free to um, reach out to Em. Her email address is listed on the Ant Mind Pit Competition website where you registered for your webinar. And thank you so much today, Em and Amy, for a great presentation. Um, for everyone on the call, thanks for joining us. And be sure to join us May 16th at 2 p.m. for the second webinar in the series, which will focus on the IDH stage. And as a reminder, we'll be posting the full webinar online at nsoc.org by the end of this week for those of you who were not able to follow through or miss something. So, M and Marianne, I'll hand it back over to you if you guys are still interested in doing any activity.